And the late Podia said, the students are troublemakers. And the secretary said, no. When you took power, the students were rejoicing. If today they have turned against you, it's, probably, it's because you have changed. Students don't change. Not until they leave college. You have to examine yourself. <laughs> Podia then said, Head of State Doe wants me to tell you that the list were sent, the Vice Head of State, executed A.B. Talbot. Uh, secretary said to him, Secretary said, Hufe is not a man who forgives easily. He said, when A.B. Talbot was arrested from the French Embassy and put in prison, Hufe Boni sent to me to ask me to intercede with Do to free A.B. Talbot. Secretary said, I send my Prime Minister, Lassana Biogogi, to Do. Do said to me, there was no problem. A.B. Talbot was all right. You go, you go to try. A couple of months later, the news got to French intelligence that A.B. Trouble had been executed. French intelligence then informed President Hufe Boigny. Hufe Boigny again sent to President Touré. He said, I've learned that A.B. Talbot has been killed. Secretary said, I send the abogi again to head of state door. Head of State Doe said it was not true. Now you have come to me to tell me to tell President Hufe Boini that A.B. Talbot was killed by the late Wesen. And Secretary said, Wesen is dead, he cannot defend himself. But I can tell you one thing. We all have to die and answer to our maker. But Hufe Boini, knowing him as I do, he will not forgive you. And so yes, when you fail realize that there was a group willing to overthrow Samuel Doe and it was stated, it was stated at the hate trial by one of the leading members of the MPFL that they were giving arms while waiting for living arms, they were giving arms by the Agorian Defense Ministry. Of course Hufe Boini knew. And because of Hufe Boini's connection in Paris, it is possible that he convinced the French. The French were heavily involved. He convinced the French that Taylor should be held. We have information from our sources that the son of the President of France, of, 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 of President Mitterrand, was in con con contact with the Taylor people. So obviously Burkina Faso, this Campori will only be courageous to send 700 to 1,000 soldiers into Liberia if he had the tacit endorsement of the French. To Hufe Boigny. Yes, now it's just possible that the French, knowing that they were going to support Mr. Taylor, knowing the connection of Hufe Boigny to Mr. Taylor and his group, and also Blaise Campari, it is just possible, it is just possible that they could have sent the signals to the Americans that uh, we can handle this, we can handle this. And that was the problem the Nigerians had. Because the Nigerians had the potential, they had the capacity to destroy the NPFL. They were stopped at every step of the way. And they kept saying to themselves, what is happening about Liberia? Why do we find it so difficult to get a consensus, a consensus to move in with full force and stop this war? Arms are coming through the Ivory Coast. So if you like, at a particular stage, because of the involvement of Hufe Boini, because of other international actors, this whole internal rebellion became a vast international conspiracy to help the Taylor people, to stop such you know, other forces who were perceived to be anti-whatever. So yes, I think and I, I must appreciate what Mr. Cohen said to you people in America. He knows, he has seen the records, but we can only conjecture that there was a desire by certain international actors to ensure that Mr. Taylor took power in Liberia. Irrespective of the fact that he was coming from Libya, which was a pariah state. 
with all his values antithetical to the values of certain international partners or actors. So yes, I believe that sincerely. And so obviously at the end, Mr. Taylor was given the president. But like all historical mirages, Mr. Taylor ended the way he did. He ended the way he did. Because this society is complex. It's complex. To rule a society, you have to understand the actors, the various forces. Why was it possible after a few years? Learn, model, all these people popping up. You cannot take power through guns and then intend to suppress people when they have already taken guns before. This crisis here, yeah. this crisis in Liberia was a crisis of leadership. 1997, the Americans, the French, the entire international community. Through the instrumentality of Peter Boy and his people, even the Nigerians have conceded to Taylor that you are president of Liberia. You are president of Liberia. We deal with you. So why all this aggression? Why all these movements into other countries? What are you trying to prove? What are you trying to prove? So that was the tragedy. The tragedy was, as Mandela said recently, is that want of leadership. You have been given power. Develop your country. Your opponents are in exile. And you are making you are making the joke to your supporters. When I leave from here, some of them will come walking with sticks. They will be so old. Vision 2021. The man didn't have vision for 20, uh, 2001. He talked about 2024. But this was the reality. So it was a, it was a, 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 a serious tragedy of leadership. And that's where we got to where we were. With more wars. With more wars. So yes, Mr. Steele. The Ivorian Steve Bonnie is there. But of course, we paid close attention to the tribe because we ourselves did not know certain things until we started following the tribe. And now the puzzle, the puzzle, is all coming into place. It's all coming into place. Our arrest, the killing of our militants, the killing of Liberians, all these talks in Washington. Socialism coming, socialism coming, in order to make way for a tailor. But like they say, history poses no problem for which there is no solution. Now, against this backdrop, would you agree with those who hold the view that Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, even the U.S., in a way, should pay reparations to Liberia for the kind of havoc that was wreaked by someone who describe as the marionette? You see, you see, my brother, uh, Commission Stewart. Men who rule country, or women who rule country, will have to realize that politics is not a Sunday school party. <laughs> The Americans have their interests to protect. They will protect their interests. It's possible they saw Taylor as having momentum. The Ivorians felt that Mr. Doe was anathema. He had killed A.B. Tober. The old man was aggrieved. Blaise Campori had to do the bearings of the old man. So these countries obviously gave support to Charles Taylor. All nations must realize, as they say, the fundamentals of international politics. There are no permanent friends, only permanent interests. What they did? They did against the background of the perception that Mr. Taylor would probably be better for their interests. Now, if you talk about these countries being Reparation, I gave you a good example. Most people do not know that the Americans are spending over $250 million every year to keep the armed forces here. To keep the armed forces. The budget of armed in Liberia is close to $800 million. Americans are paying over, over $250 million. I think that's reparation enough. Now, it's possible some folks say, they move. But you see, big nations have their interests. You must understand how you engage them. And
And that is why the leader must be a strategist. You must identify where there are ideas or interests of convergence. If you ask America to pay, and America say we're not paying, are you going to invade New York or Washington? <laughs> Blaise Campari. Blaise Campari. Blaise Campari. I've never been to Burkina Faso. I was a great admirer of Thomas Sankara. And I always remember his famous quotation. A soldier with our political education is a potential bandit. That was Sankara. I've never been to Mr. Kampori's country, and I hope I never go there while he's there. Kampori has been identified by the United Nations as a, as a seller of arms to UNITA in Angola, as a trafficker in diamonds, as one of the men, the one of the men who fomented this civilization in West Africa. Have you heard anybody talk about Kampari going to war crimes or so? That is the nature of international politics. Mr. Kampari has big backers, huge backers with nuclear weapons. Kampari is going nowhere. That is what I charted I did not realize. This Kampari has been this, the epic center of all destabilization movements. In West Africa, in East Africa, nobody has taken him. Nobody will take him. They are even organizing ECOWAS meeting in Ouagadougou. No, it's different. You can't force them to pay a reparation. La Côte d'Ivoire, they have their own crisis. They will tell you that was Hugh Bonnie, that's not us. You want to name and shame them? Do so. But what? What would it benefit you? Are you going to now sell the blood of your people who have died? The over 250,000? You're going to pay, ask for payment for the blood? Ask for payment for the blood? That they were instrumental in promoting wars? No. What we do is that we strengthen our country, educate our citizens, so that tomorrow, no army, no old man because of his relationship with people can invade our country, even when on may leave. It's our responsibility. I think to go groveling before these people, begging them, pay us reparation. Liberia is destroyed. So, other nations have been destroyed through wars. Angola, 30 years of wars. Other people have fought wars. Nicaragua, Vietnam. They are building their own country. The worst thing you can do to the, the memory of those who died is to say to those who were responsible for ex external actors, pay us for the death of our people. You don't do that. Instead what we do, we establish a massive monument and select a day in our history where every day we go and remind our children and their children that men died because of so and so reasons and we must make sure that this will never happen again. That's what we can do. Let us not be beggars to those who laugh that because we were weak on the developed that they could do what they wanted to do to our country. Our duty and your duty as young men and women is to ensure that your leaders strengthen your country, empower you as young people, not to be afraid, but to be able to defend yourselves at any time. So tomorrow, these borders will not be porous. If you don't do that, and you go to Mr. Kampori, you go to the Ivorians, you go to the Americans, what they will conclude is that these poor black people are now selling blood for money. It's, it's not blood diamonds, it's blood for money. The people have died, they are begging for money. We got gold, we got diamond, we got rubber, we got timber, we got iron ore, we got marine resources. People say we are rich, it is not reflected in the welfare of our people. We must be bold enough to say, we will seize our resources and deposit them in the laps of our people. Our partners can walk along with us. And so the message we send to those is that when we strengthen ourselves and mobilize our people, if you dare come again, you will find a united people, angry and determined, that there will not be a repetition of this history.
Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, as a prominent politician and a political scientist, how do you reckon the? I'm talking about the Liberian situation. How do you think uh, the politics of the Cold War impacts regional decision making vis-à-vis the resolution of the Liberian crisis? Well, you see, I think it was very easy. Now, after the Cold War, it was obvious that nobody could play the card. Nobody could play the communist card. So people like the late Ruth Boini and his partners in West Africa decided that, of course, they would support whoever they wanted to support. But when the Nigerians came in with ECHO, the whole Liberian peacekeeping took another dimension. Because under President Babaginda, the Nigerians were determined that the Nigerian army will not be humiliated in Liberia. They were determined. But they realized one thing, that if major powers were supporting Charles Taylor, there could only be one reason, and that was to humiliate the Nigerian army to such an extent that it would go back home, implode, and there would be a change. Because you know, the Western powers had an example. It happened in Argentina. The military had taken power in Argentina. A very repressive military regime. And when the Western powers wanted to destroy the Argentinian army, it's legitimacy, it simply went into the Falklands. When they got into the Falkland Island, they were beaten back. When they went back home, the people said, this is an army that cannot even defend our sovereignty. So, what legitimacy do you have to rule? The army had to go back to the barracks. The Nigerians were always aware of the Argent- Argentine example that if they were not careful in Liberia, they would be shamed into withdrawing and Mr. Taylor would crown his victory with the defeat of Nigeria, which would then have to deal with the problem of Nigerian citizens demanding a civilian rule. And I'm saying here, what obtained here was that the, the French, and I say, I may both say, the French have always been suspicious of the Nigerians in West Africa. Because for them, they felt that the Nigerians had this policy of Pak Pak Nigeriana, like the Americans have theirs of Pak Americana, of Pak Britannia. That the Nigerians had this whole thing of a Pak Nigeria, Nigeriana. The Nigerians were also very wary of the French, because France was the only major country that supported the buyer of France in the struggle for secession. The French was the only France was the only country. So the Nigerians were very hesitant that with the French involvement through Hufi Boini, they had to be very careful because France will never allow the defeat of a group supported by Hufi Boini in Liberia. And it's possible, it's possible, it's just possible that Abacha got the signal and decided that Nigeria should cut its losses and leave the power given to Mr. Taylor. Yes. The regional configuration of power at that time favored Hugh Boini because he had serious backing. Serious backing. And he exploited that. You can't blame him. You can't even blame Mr. Taylor. And the whole idea of the Cold War at its end, at its end, if you were to bring up the question of communism, the Americans felt that this system was dying. Any African who toyed with the system was crazy. And I still believe, I still believe, in my heart for heart, that one reason why the Americans probably abandoned Samuel Doe was when he started dealing with Nikolai Ceausescu of Romania. The Americans felt that this was the end of the Cold War. The Soviet system was imploring. From within it was being destroyed. Ceausescu was the last remaining Stalinist communist. And he was moving around to solidify his position. It was the time that Samuel Doe brought him here, gave him a doctorate degree, brought in tanks from this man. And for the Americans, Mr. Doe didn't really understand the nature of the international struggle. And so, yes, those who promoted Mr. Taylor and helped him had a conjunction 
the whole idea of the regional grouping of power under Hussein Hussein Boini and also the fear of certain international actors that no, no pro-communist or pro-Russian or sympathizer of any communist will emerge in any West African country. This was the age of the American century. I think that's what Mr. Cohen was trying to say. This was the age of the American century. And so therefore, Mr. Doe fell victim to forces he did not understand that he, he could never comprehend. Veto for Mr. Taylor. With the fall of communism, there was no more. He tried several times to pin this eye, this exile as communist sympathizers. But he failed to realize with the, with the end of the Cold War, another boogeyman had emerged, and that was so-called Islamic fundamentalism, which the Americans realized. And poor Mr. Taylor, hard for business, finally decided to deal with elements who came looking for diamond without him realizing that these people were members of Al-Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. And so therefore the Americans felt that, but this is a dangerous young man. We gave you power, we allow you to rule, we've been interacting with you, and you bring Al-Qaeda to Liberia. These were the people who blew up, who blew up the, the Twin Towers in America. And at the, at the head, some of the people said, yes, we knew them, we saw them. These are pictures the FBI put out. These are the people Mr. Taylor was dealing with. For the Americans, that was unforgivable. Like though, like Taylor, was strange. Now, as a follow-up, given what you said, what would you say were the perspectives of other players in the sub-region like Sierra Leone, Ghana, and how did such perspectives shape or help to influence the outcome, the final outcome, as we saw it, or the, the developments in the uh, sub-region, so to speak? Well, let me start with Sierra Leone. Let me start with Sierra Leone. <clears throat> that I know a lot of. I had, I had revealed to the Sierra Leone authorities because I found out in Tripoli that Fodi Sakon was very close to Taylor. And I had spoken to the ideologue of the RUF, a fellow called Professor ha uh, Cleo Hansen, he's dead now. The one who gave me the RUF manifesto in 87. And I had told the Sierra Leoneans that there's going to be trouble. That these guys are coming called the RUF. I have a problem with them because they are dealing with this man called Taylor. So for Selun, they had to stop whatever was developing in Liberia. So of course, Mama was predisposed to ECOMOS being formed when we realized that it would be necessary to stop any regional confrontation. The best solution would be to go in as a force. In the case of Ghana, the Nigerians felt that they would go into Liberia. They had a responsibility as a major player to stop the crisis in Liberia. And so they wanted to convince the Ghanaians to go. That the Nigerians felt that if they had come in alone, it would give the impression to the French, the Ivorians, that they were stopping the interest of certain people. So they convinced the Ghanaians that if we want to help sister African countries, we have to go as a force in there to make sure that we separate the belligerents, the fighters, bring these people to discuss. It was based on that, that President Momo offered his country as a base for the Nigerians who had gone in with the 1,004 men post when they couldn't stop in Morovia. The Ghanaian government was convinced it was necessary to come into Liberia to help. They sent forces too. The Guineans who were ready to come to those aid, but had been told that they would have to fight a war, probably with a backing against Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso, they decided to join because it was in the interest to ensure that no pro burkina or pro Ivorian regime took power in Liberia. And if you notice, President Daudra Jarawa of the Gambia was then the chairman of ECOWAS. Every Francophone country refused to be a part of the initial ECOWAS. ECOMOC. 
the four countries except Guinea, the four the countries which are involved, 